Level 989. Welcome to 989 on Health, where you don't need years of university to understand the latest news about health and related subjects. As always, we've created a list of helpful links on today's topic at our website, level989.com. And those same links should also be available in your podcast playing app of choice. This is an informal discussion sharing our personal viewpoints on health and wellness. Don't rely on the information in this podcast as an alternative to medical advice from a professional health care provider. For the full disclaimer, please see our website. I'm Mike Davalos, just a guy, your average Joe, and I'm joined by the opposite of average, Brandon Weintraub, a primary care physician. Good morning, Brandon. Good morning, Mike. Our topic for today is... Actually, it's an intervention! A what? An intervention? For what? I was cleaning our podcasting studio the other day. You know, I'm straightening your desk, and I found a whole stack of pamphlets and brochures about... Well, I mean, this is a delicate thing to bring up, but they were about joining a cult. Now, a cult has nothing to mess around with, Brandon. It's like that episode of Portlandia, you know, the TV show. I think I've referred to this before on the show, but just in case anyone's forgotten... This nice, normal couple goes on a perfectly innocent visit to a chicken farm, as you do, and the next thing they know, they're in this chicken farm cult and married to the farmer guy. Suddenly, they're all happy, living a good, clean life as farmers, getting along with everybody, working together in harmony. Hmm, actually, that sounds pretty good. Can you introduce me to your cult leader? Oh, I see what's going on. I'm sorry to disappoint you and ruin your intervention, or dash your hopes about accompanying me. Actually, I'm... Not sure which one. But I'm not joining a cult. I was doing research on some nutrition related groups for a future episode of the podcast. I'm not really completely ready yet, but we can talk about it today if it would put your mind at ease. Hmm. Yeah, I think we better clear this up. What's going on? First of all, and I'm not trying to downplay any of the unfortunate events that have occurred in the past, but I'd like to clarify what a cult is. You so often hear the word with a negative connotation. So often, in fact, that most people consider the word almost exclusively negative. But there's nothing inherently bad about the concept. A cult is nothing more than a social group that shares, and is defined by, spiritual or philosophical beliefs, a common interest, or a goal. Many cults you hear about, usually through news stations you avail yourself of, have beliefs strongly opposed to mainstream values. That makes it tempting to lump every group that becomes popular enough to be reported about in the cults are evil category. Replace the word cult with the word social group, and the sudden aversion you probably had throughout my little diatribe just now softens a bit, right? A social group is made up of people, and people can have positive beliefs and negative beliefs, but it is much more difficult to say to yourself, all social groups are evil. The word cult has its origins in Latin, cultus, meaning care. And while it did originally imply a religious connection, it's evolved in modern usage. In fact, the word culture embodies the most accurate portrayal in modern English. The beliefs, arts, and practices of a particular society group or time period, that is culture. And each member of that culture is a part of that cult. There's the culture of your family's traditions, or, in today's business world, something called corporate culture. Okay, I get it. When you put it that way, I guess you could say that Star Trek fans are part of a culture, or a culture filled with people who love the Denver Broncos. Exactly. Even though they aren't called cults because of the negative connotation that word has developed, if people are caring and sharing a set of common ideals and beliefs, that's exactly what you've got. Finally, let me guide our conversation to a more medical context. Keep in mind that culture can apply just as firmly to the groups and associations a patient is part of on a daily basis. If our more sedentary listeners ever visit a bodybuilder web forum, it will very quickly become apparent that many health-centered groups possess cultures of their very own. Okay, so just so I'm clear, item number one, you are not now, nor are you planning to, join a cult. Well, no cult in the negative tracksuit and fruit punch, as you're probably implying. Correct. Items two and three, based on what you just said, we are all in a cult, or many cults right now, as in culture. Sounds a lot like couture, doesn't it? But we're not talking about clothing or fashion trends. Our families, our schools, workplaces, religious affiliations, it's all the culture we're in. It's like those old Palmolive dish soap commercials. You're soaking in it. Probably too young to remember those commercials. 
Ah, Mike, I can always count on you for an offbeat turn of phrase. Yes, every group and fandom you're a part of is a culture of sort. Thanks, I think. So, now that we've got all this sorted out, clarified, and defined, do we have a point bringing up cults and culture? Well, have you ever taken a moment to consider how all of the people and groups in your life, we'll just call that your culture from this point on, okay? Have you ever really analyzed how your culture impacts your own personal health and wellness? Hmm. I have to admit I haven't really thought about it. Give me some time here. We might have to edit out a bunch of silence so our listeners don't have to wait through me hemming and hawing. Um, not really coming up with anything. Maybe I'm just not sure what exactly the question is you're asking. Maybe you can break it down into parts, like a Cosmo quiz of cultural wellness. Maybe our listeners can follow along and think of their own answers as we go. Good plan. I'm game for a multiple choice quiz any day. Let's do it. Question one. Just offhand. Would you say your culture, A, encourages your wellness, B, is neutral in regards to your wellness, or C, discourages wellness? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, somewhere between neutral and discourages, I guess. Nobody's going out of their way to help out a random Joe. Popular culture or media? I mean, a a commercial I see about food has a 90% chance of focusing on carbs, fats, and salt. You know, the delicious food groups, not spinach and kale. (laughs) Hmm. No one's going out of their way. Consider that answer noted. You've mentioned a few social categories earlier. School, work, family, friends. Let's continue our quiz questions there. School. You're taking some classes at your local community college, right? In terms of healthcare options, does your school offer A. A wide variety of classes and opportunities to learn about healthier lifestyle options and apply them. B. Some options, like providing healthier alternatives for meals and a gym membership. Or C, no additional classes, lectures, or opportunities to improve your overall wellness. School. Hmm. I'm going to have to answer D uh, and admit I'm not really sure. You know, I take online classes because I'm able to fit it in around my work schedule. So I never actually go to the campus. You know, there's people there. They might try to talk to me. Okay, school options. You know what? Let me pull up the internet and take a look here. Hmm. Okay, well, it looks like there's options for baseball, soccer, track, weightlifting, basketball, volleyball. Also, student health fairs, resources to quit smoking. That actually sounds like answer A might be appropriate for you. You've been taking classes for at least six months, if I remember correctly. So I have to ask, why haven't you looked into any of this yet? I just didn't think to look. I mean, also, I take online classes because I'm actually something of a shy person who's not likely to just drop into the college fitness center where he knows nobody. And this really ties into the friends question. Uh, Not to jump ahead, but most of the people I know and like and would want to hang out or exercise with, they all live an hour or two away. And how much time does your homework take you, would you say? Well, I'm only taking two classes this semester, so maybe four to six hours a week. I don't know if that's typical or if I'm just a slow studier. And this isn't really part of the quiz, or is it? But what's your ultimate goal with school? Well, you know, I'm not sure exactly at this point, but I want to get a medically related position that lets me work from home. Oh yeah, I'll be able to work in my pajamas. I might even go for days on end without going out into the noisy, crowded world. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, what's next? Work. In terms of wellness options provided at your place of employment, do you, A... Have a work-provided health package that includes things like discounts to local health providers, gyms, and grocery stores? B. Find you are provided with a good health insurance plan that provides you with at least some options in terms of wellness and health maintenance? Or C. Have little to no insurance coverage and few, if any, additional options provided to you? I'm going to answer B. We have a yearly health checkup. It's actually some outside health organization doing a research study, maybe. Of course, being me, I'm very much of a daydreamer, you know, off in my own little world. So sometimes I imagine these medical guys are doing some weird experiment on us. But that's just my imagination running away. They weigh us, measure us, take a blood sample. They've done this for the past few years. I remember I sent you the test results last year. They were pretty detailed results that tested like 20 or more different factors. And they just did the test again about a week ago. Uh, I think this is definitely something that should happen at more workplaces, since some people actively avoid ever going to the doctor. 
I remember you mentioning those checkups. I'll be interested in seeing your newest results once you get them. Uh, anything else going on through your employer? I think there's a Weight Watchers campaign once a year, where for like a month you go into the Human Resources office and get weighed once a week. I think the winner gets 50 bucks or something. Interesting. Uh, you've been hoping to lose a few pounds, as I recall. I think you've even mentioned it in a previous episode or two. I'm going to assume you've participated, right? After all, I, I know having a firm motivator is important to you. 50 bucks is 50 bucks. Nah, you know, it's not really my thing. It's additional interaction with others time that I'd rather avoid. I just get kind of impatient with it. All those guys at work want to talk about is sports. I don't know anything about sports at all. So I just tend to avoid the social interactions. Anyway, nah, I'm not much of a joiner. Of course, you're no lemming. You chart your own course. Are there any other work wellness programs you can think of? Not really. I mean, remember, this is factory work, not some magical wonderland workplace like Google or Amazon. There's no quit smoking program at work because I remember one of the employees asking about that at a recent meeting. Uh, you know, I'm surprised that quit smoking programs aren't a required part of a company's health plan by this point. I mean, I don't smoke, but there's probably 30 people at work who do. Uh, now, we haven't really mentioned smoking before, outside of a brief mention during the vaping episode, maybe. Is smoking still a big problem in the 21st century? I'm always glad to hear when patients aren't smokers, and I'm especially glad you are not a smoker, good sir. Uh, even with all the patches, pills, and modern gadgetry, it's very difficult to quit, and I applaud anyone who succeeds or has even decided to try. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 million people, that's about 15% of the population, are smokers. The U.S. spends nearly $300 billion a year treating smoking-related illnesses. So I would venture to say it is most definitely still a big problem. Back to our quiz, though. Any other work programs to mention? Does your company offer any discounts to a local gym or something like that? Gym discounts? No. I think I would remember that. For my work, that's all I can think of. And when you think about what other companies do, especially in Japan, you realize how far the U.S. has to go. I'm not trying to derail us from your culture quiz, but while we're on the topic, what do you know about the Japanese approach to workplace fitness? Only what I've heard through mainstream media sources, unfortunately. So I can't say for certain this is as widespread and common as I'd like to believe it is. A large percentage of any person's hours are spent at work, whether here or in other countries. I've heard it said that people with full-time jobs often spend more time with co-workers than friends and family. Using the U.S. as an example, if you add up commuting time, working hours, adequate sleep, you end up with an average of 16 hours a day completely unavailable, leaving six hours to accomplish everything else a person might need to do. To try to combat the sedentary, unhealthy lifestyle this type of work life creates, many companies in Japan require their workers to perform regular calisthenics before starting work and at regular intervals throughout the workday. Movements like lunges, jumping jacks, sit-ups, push-ups, and different Tai Chi-esque forms. Doesn't surprise me that you know that. You've got the idea. And it goes farther and smarter than just simple exercises even. I'm going to quote here from a LinkedIn article on the topic from Scott Lister of Sportlink Limited. One of the first experimenters with this approach was Honda. When they hired new employees for the assembly line, Instead of putting them to work immediately, they enrolled them in two weeks of exercise classes designed to simulate the movements they would need to perform on the job. Their on-the-job accident rates dropped significantly, and the workers' productivity increased. The employees logged far fewer sick days. I think that's pretty clever. I mean, you could argue that the company was incentivized for more from a productivity standpoint than a wellness angle, but the employees still enjoyed the benefits of exercise. I hadn't read that article before, but it makes sense. Exercise, as long as it isn't overdone, tends to have many positive impacts. So even if a corporation is only concerned with reducing work accidents, workers are still going to enjoy the health benefits. Agreed. And there's even numerous radio calisthenics programs in Japan. So people at home, work, city parks, other public places can follow along, get their blood and their lymph flowing. It's not just something you see very much in the United States. You mentioned commuting a moment ago. There are some cities that have spent millions of dollars becoming more bike-friendly for commuters, like Seattle, for example. According to the U.S. Census, as of 2014, 3.4% of Seattle workers commute by bicycle. And that percentage doesn't seem that high, but it's actually much higher than the national average of 0.6%. And in Seattle, that actually turns out to be about 12,000 people biking to work, with another 31,000 who walk to work. And I'm sure that the cooler weather in Seattle definitely plays a role in these numbers. And of course, it's not just about the city making better bike lanes. 
workplaces also have to play their part by having bike racks installed and even locker rooms with showers for people to clean up and change after their bike commute. Well, since you brought it up, do you bike to work? You know, I hadn't even considered it. Well, I mean, part of it is I don't even own a bike. That's easy enough to fix, of course. Uh, My current job is probably the first one I've ever had that was close enough. I'm just under five miles from work. According to Google Maps cycling directions feature, it should take me about 22 minutes to bike to work. It's actually only about 10 minutes longer than it takes to drive it in my car. Weird. But this is Florida, man. It gets like 95 degrees here pretty often. I'd be getting to work very hot and sweaty. And with my work schedule, I'd be biking home at 1 a.m., which I know my good lady wife would not appreciate. I have a lot of respect for those people who bike to work, fighting really scary traffic, and literally risking their lives. That would be very, very late indeed. And I don't like to bike or run in the heat of the day either, so I can't blame you too much for not biking to work. Maybe your workplace has a shower facility? I mean, baking is messy, right? Surely all you hardworking folks covered in flour and soot from the ovens want to shower before you head home, or to clean yourselves up before getting to work mixing the giant vats of dough. We do actually have showers on site, but no one uses them. They're kind of in a sad state of disrepair, unfortunately. I think if a person had a big accident with liquid glaze or something, they might have to have a rinse off before they could put on a fresh uniform, but I haven't seen anyone using them to clean up before or after their shift. Okay, I admit I may have been romanticizing your workplace a little. Before we finish up the work wellness discussion, I have to say you seem to be in favor of workplace calisthenics when we discussed it just now. So, would you participate if it was an option at your work? Work calisthenics. If it took place while I was on the clock, sure. If it was inside with air conditioning, because Florida. But I doubt I'd be willing to come in early and do it on my own time. This is an informative quiz so far. All right, next up is family. If I remember correctly, other than your wife, most of your family lives thousands of miles away. That's right. Ohio. Hello, Ohio. So we'll focus on the family member you do see on a daily basis. Would you say that your significant other, A, actively promotes and encourages you to keep your health and wellness in mind, B, neither promotes nor discourages your habits and desires to live a healthier lifestyle, or C, acts, at least on some level, to discourage your activities towards wellness? Well, I'm going to say A, of course. So what do you and your wife do together that promotes wellness? Well, my wife is a skincare specialist, so she's very good at making sure I wear sunscreen, and she keeps a close eye on my epidermis for any worrisome moles that might be trying to kill me. So that's great. Yeah, if I were to admit to a problem with wellness in my wife, it would be that we have very different work schedules. So we'd never be able to go to the gym together or anything. Sometimes we take walks together or do a fitness video, mostly low-impact moving and stretching and yoga-like stuff. I have to admit that's pretty rare because of our schedules. That's fair. And we've mentioned the gym a couple of times now, so I guess it's only fair that I ask the question. Do you go to a gym or take any fitness-related classes like spinning or Zumba? Before I forget, uh, mentioning Florida makes me really think about how different wellness culture is in different places where I've lived. In Cleveland, almost no one had a gym membership. And when I lived in California, it was the reverse. Everyone was going to the gym, even me. The idea that Californians are health-conscious is a stereotype for a reason. It's true. Oh, your question. No, I don't go to a gym. I don't have a membership or anything. You know, we do have an exercise room and a pool at our apartment complex that I'm paying for, but it's not like I would ever get it all to myself. People are always there playing loud music, talking loudly on their phones, just generally being annoying. And I typically have to wait for someone else to finish up before I can use the equipment I want. I don't have the patience for that. Then gyms and all that other stuff, it, I mean, it's pretty expensive. I work 40 hours a week, but my work schedule's pretty uneven. As you know from trying to keep a regular recording schedule for the podcast, so trying to attend a regular fitness class would be difficult. I'd almost certainly end up paying for classes I couldn't go to, which would really feel like a waste of money. I work second shift, first shift, and sometimes a random third shift. A lot of the answers you've given end up coming back to your workplace, and I'd bet that's true for most of our listeners. Your company has you, as an employee, in a category that's called shift work. According to the National Institutes of Health, about 20% of the workforce, that's more than 13.5 million workers, are in the same category. I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that there are a lot of health impacts for shift workers like yourself. We'll post a link to the NIH article in the show notes, but to quote from the article, shift work can result in, quote, 
disturbance of the quantity and quality of sleep, disturbance of gastrointestinal and other organ system activities, and aggravation of diseases such as diabetes mellitus, epilepsy, and thyrotoxicosis, end quote. And before you ask, thyrotoxicosis is a condition where your thyroid gland produces too great a serum level of thyroid hormone, specifically free T4 and maybe T3, which accelerates your metabolism and results in a number of other negative impacts on your health. There's another article that we'll also link to from the Institute for Work and Health, which lists a series of even more serious impacts of shift work, including an increased risk of cancer. Yeah, shift work is definitely not a fun way to work and live, but it does pay well, probably because they couldn't get people to agree to work there if the money wasn't a strong motivator. So with all this work, driving, and sleeping you're doing, where do you get your social interaction? From what you've described, you don't get a chance to see your wife, friends, or even your family very often. You must have an extremely dedicated group of online socialites on Facebook and Twitter. No, no pals online. Not that I keep in touch with right now, anyway. I was into blogging almost every day for years. I had a group of blogging pals. That was a long time ago. I mean, it's been like five years at least, I think. I miss you guys. Now, this might sound sad to say, but the podcasts I listen to have kind of become my buddies. You know, I listen to shows like The Incomparable where a big group of very smart, funny people talk about the books, TV shows, and movies I enjoy. So it's like I can hang out with them anytime I want. And I do, probably for a couple of hours every day. Hmm. Is there anything else we've missed? Any organizations or clubs you're a part of that we should include as part of your culture? Uh, volunteer work, a uh, book club, canasta? You've always struck me as the kind of person who enjoyed their Sunday evening mahjong meet. <laughs> no, no, no mahjong. Uh, no, nothing I can think of. I pretty much just work, sleep, do homework, and podcast. Maybe hosting a health information podcast would qualify as work for the community. I suppose it could, since you mention our podcast. Without proper context, it isn't medically relevant, so we haven't discussed for our listeners the work it takes for you to make 989 on health. What kind of time are we talking about getting the podcast-related tasks done? a team effort, of course. Uh, you do a great job of sciencing it up. My side of researching and writing up the topics can take six to eight hours a week. So we record for about two hours a week. Some of that time is just chit chat and vocal warm up, of course. Uh, then editing an episode can take me about six hours, start to finish. I'm a very finicky editor. And then another half an hour or so to upload to the website, write up the description, put all the links in the show notes. So say 14 hours a week, but that's it's all spread out. I don't sit down for 14 hours at a stretch and do it all. Wow, that's longer than I thought. So you're sitting at the computer at home for 20 hours a week, just between homework and podcasting? And I'll bet there's some web surfing in there too. Maybe some video game playing? A bit of web surfing. I mostly do my video gaming and surfing on my phone these days. If you can call browsing Reddit surfing the web. Uh, but how does my homework and podcasting factor into my culture and its impact on my wellness? Is it just because of the sitting for 20 hours detail? It's a pretty important detail. So is that it? What's the score? Is there a score? Just how badly is my culture letting me down? Yeah. It looks as if the score might be lower than I expected. Let me just finalize it here. Crunch the numbers. <laughs> All right. You definitely fall in the needs a better cult category. Youch. Ha. Just as I thought. <laughs> culture letting me down. The subject demonstrates little to no engagement in a health and wellness capacity with family, friends, local or online community, or workplace. Wait, 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 what? Subject uses claims of social awkwardness to justify dissociative tendencies, spending an excessive amount of time in sedentary pursuits, turning his attention inward and replacing real-life humans with recorded entertainments about pop and geek culture to the detriment of his mental well-being and physical health. But no, hey! This episode turned out to be an intervention, all right? An intervention for you! Um, uh, what? I think the answers you gave today made it pretty clear. The thing about cultures, about cults, is that they are things people join, not just something you fall into that happens around you. In order to be a part of a culture that assists you to become a healthier person, you need to participate in the options and lifestyles that exist around you. Or, as Yoda might say from The Empire Strikes Back, I cannot teach him. The boy has no patience. 
you must have the deepest commitment, the most serious mind. This one, a long time have I watched, all his life, as he looked away, to the future, to the horizon. Never his mind on where he was, hmm? What he was doing. Hold on, hold on. First of all, stop talking about me as the subject. Second, are you really trying to use a Star Wars reference to get my attention? Hey, you admitted to loving nerd culture. We discussed the need for a good diet and exercise on this show every two weeks. You're doing six hours of health research every week, but the statistics don't apply to you. You spend, what did you say, 14 hours a week on this podcast? Perhaps the best thing I can do for your health would be to kill this podcast. If you spent just half your podcasting time, a little more than one hour a day, seven days a week, exercising, your health would be better off. You wouldn't really kill the podcast, would you? This, this isn't an ultimatum, but if I need to choose between an online radio show and you, I choose you. And your plan to work from home is a concern as well. It seems like you need to spend less time at home alone, not more. You know those ankle bracelets that track people paroled from jail? I think you need one of those, but with a reverse goal, to make sure you don't stay at home and that you are out and about. I'm not setting out to be unhealthy. I'm just kind of easily irritated by people more than I'm shy or nervous. I'm just a, a grumpy Gus when I'm in public, so I'm just happier at home. I understand that, but it's also possible that by severely limiting your interactions with public places, small frustrations may seem magnified rather than commonplace. And like any diagnosis and any prescription, I can explain my findings, I can offer solutions, but I can't make you take the medicine or change your behavior. It would be hard for me to watch you become even more of a hermit and watch the impacts on your health. So please consider upping your engagement with your many, many options. It will definitely be to your benefit. I will definitely consider it carefully. I have to admit, I am, in fact, a bit afraid of what will happen if I get the chance to work from home, if I'm not careful about diet and exercise. Hopefully our listeners realized a few ways to better engage with their own cultures, too. Is there anything else you want to mention before we wrap it up? I know this episode probably seemed a little silly, a little personal, but I think we've done a good job of illustrating our point as a result. When we talk about the changes a person can make to their lives, it is all too easy to internalize the statistics and come to the conclusion, but these are about other people, not me. I'm already doing more for myself and my overall wellness than other people. There are always reasons and difficulties involved in trying to live a healthier lifestyle. Our regular Joe has been kind enough to share some of his personal roadblocks with us for today's episode in an attempt to make things all the more poignant for our listeners. The things that hold us back from our wellness goals often seem perfectly reasonable. It's only when we get the chance to answer some tough questions that we see how we, more than anything else, play a role in keeping ourselves in less than advantageous cultures. I know I, for one, ignore my advice on all too regular a basis. Excuses not to sleep as much as I ought to, or to poorly moderate my own stressors from work, seem to pop up all the time. Taking a step back and recognizing that your engagement plays a big role in your health and wellness is critically important. I don't usually interrupt, but I was reading an article that said people who make an effort to be healthier can reduce their risk of early death by 76% by being engaged and active in finding things to help you eat right or exercise more or reduce your daily stress or sleep better, people can significantly decrease their risk of early death. And that's the most important takeaway from this episode I could hope for. Maybe the alternative title for this episode could be Engagement in Wellness. I'll let Mike give us the wrap up. And for today's closing message, I urge you to listen closely to his last three words. That's all the time we have for today. These short episodes are a brief overview of very complex topics. Everything we say is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Licensed healthcare professionals should advise you and be aware of changes you're planning to make to any aspect of your healthcare. Every person's needs are different. The links to references we've made about news articles, medical studies, or other materials can be found at level989.com along with our contact information and the complete don't take medical advice from podcasts disclaimer. Thanks for listening, and now go health yourself.